Greetings and welcome. We are in Freshman Honors English and our objective now for the hour is to begin our conversation in regards to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Now as we look at R&J, I want to go back to an observation or two that I made before. And that is Shakespeare's intentional reaching to his audience. In the Globe Theater, there are two audiences represented by Shakespeare and his viewing audience. Two of them, alright? So let's identify them in our notes. One, that group that stands there at the bottom of, or in front of the stage, this is the group that is looking to try to uh, get the cheap seats, we might call them that for your notes, the cheap seats. And these are the individuals who are there primarily to be entertained, okay? That's what they're really doing. They're there for entertainment purposes, especially blood guts and things like that, okay? Our other group, okay, are the ones that are going to sit up in the theater itself. This we'll call our philosophic group, our thinkers group. These are the people who come to be impressed and impressioned by many of the questions of Shakespeare. And as we get into Romeo and Juliet right away, we're going to see that Shakespeare is definitely able to play to both groups. Play to both groups. In other words, he's going to entertain both groups. All right, And that will be a significant moment for us as we start to kind of look at what it is that we call Shakespeare's project. His reaching both groups, and here's why. For him to make money... He had to have his audience members come back again and again to these plays. Do you got me? That's how he made his money. People buying tickets to come back again and again to the plays and watch them again. See, I can play this game real quickly. Watch how this works. I think this will still work for us. If you've ever watched some part or all of a Jackie Chan film, raise your hand. Now just look around. Because every hand... Now, you can put that down. I've got one other question before I make my point. If you've ever watched a Jackie Chan film, the same film, more than one time, raise your hand. Now, why is that? All the, all the hands go up again. Now, why is that? Because what? The Jackie Chan film's plot lines are so unbelievably complex that you have to watch them a second time to be able to remember it? No. See, let's point out something. We are not a very strange clan of Jackie Chan viewers in the small enclave of Worland, Wyoming, right? In other words, if I were to go to Cherry Creek in Denver and ask the same question, guess what? Everybody raises their hand. If I go to Okisho High School in Okinawa, Japan and ask them, guess what? Everybody raises their hand. This is a ubiquitous phenomenon, but Jackie Chan figured out what Shakespeare invented for your notes. The way you make money is to get them to watch it a second time. You get them to come back over and over again, all right? Now, that is the key in regards to understanding what it is that Shakespeare pulls off, okay? So as we take a look now at the play, we want to ask ourselves a simple question. You want, to add, you want to put this in your notes now. What is that question? Question, how does, in Romeo and Juliet, since that's the text we'll be studying, how does Shakespeare reach both audiences, that is to say that groundling audience that's there primarily for entertainment purposes, and the audience of the thinking audience, how does he reach them at the same time? Okay. So for example, in the opening sequences of this play, supposedly a play of love, right? We've heard that said before, this is the greatest play of love. In the greatest play of love, we don't start out at all with love. What do we start out with? Comedy. To some degree, comedy. Heat. Yeah, thank you. That's really what it is. We start out with nasty fighting, right? Nasty fighting. So, for example, how about this? What if we invited all of the people from Worland to come to the middle school theater to watch a, a play performance of a Worland High School actors? And out onto the stage walks, walks Mr. Schreiber, who's one of the actors, and he just starts giving the middle finger a hand gesture. <laughs> Right? <laughs> to all of the audience members. Okay? Now, can you imagine how the mayor and all the other people in the community of Worland might take to this? Can you understand why Shakespeare's audience uh, or uh, the Puritans are going to shut down his theater, his theater several times, right? Uh, wait a minute. The opening sequence of Roman Juliet begins with a fight, but it begins with a fight because of why? Because of why? 
Do you remember why they start fighting? We have two families represented, the Capulets and the Montagues. That is true. But wait a minute. Why, Mr. Baumstark? What is it that happens in the beginning of the play that leads to the fight in the first place? Oh, dude. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Schreiber. Did you just see what Schreiber did? Do it again, Schreiber for all. Don't do it at Mr. McGee. Oh. Seriously? I mean, do you know what it means to bite your thumb at somebody? At, well, that's, yeah. It, I mean, remember, when do we write down the date for this play? Roughly what? 1600, right? In 1600, if you want to give somebody the bad, bad uh, finger, you don't give the middle finger in 1600, what do you do? You do what Schreiber just did to Mr. McGee, only actually it's worse. It means something a lot worse. So yeah, right away, we're going to have a nasty hand gesture, the biting of the thumb. Of course, if you'll think about it, I mean, a middle finger, really? What's the difference between a middle finger and an index finger? And why does the middle finger mean something that the index finger, right? I mean, this is all kind of arbitrary anyway, right? For Shakespeare's day, it's on the middle finger, it's biting of the thumb. And in that process, starting a really nasty fight, are you ready for this? The play about love begins with fighting. Fighting. And here in a little bit, when we see Romeo for the first time, he comes on stage. He's going to see a pool of blood on stage. And he will ask his buddy, what's, what's this all about? The blood on the stage, what's this all about? And then he'll immediately say, don't tell me. I already know. He said, I've heard it all before. There's something to do with love here. But he says... You know, it's like, it's more love than hate. He says, this no doubt is a product of hate, which of course it is, right? Capulets hate Montagues and so forth. But he says, it seems like it has more to do with love than with hate. Whoa, whoa, whoa. how can it have to do with love? They're jacking on each other. How is that love? Well, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Capulets hate Montagues. But why do they fight? Because Capulets love Capulets more than they love Montague. See how that works? In other words, there's a fine line between love and hate. Right? Fine line between love and hate. So, for example, the girl will say, Oh, he's the greatest guy in the whole Swites world. Oh, I'm so in love with him. And then five days later, she's ready to gut it. She hates his guts. Now, how do you account for that? Well, Shakespeare sees going to make this observation. That's the strange thing about love. It's a fine line between love and hate. And he's going to show it iconically on stage by having people fight over the thing they love. Right? And then, of course, he's going to show it to us constantly again and again. So Shakespeare will reach both audiences. He'll have blood and guts, which that groundling audience loves. He'll also have for the thinking audience this observation about what it means to say you're in love. And why do we call it falling in love? Now, that's really interesting because, for example, if Schreiber got up and started walking towards the back of Brazelton where to trip him and he falls on his face, bam, it would, of course, be funny to everybody except for Schreiber, right? <laughs> and then uh, we, we normally don't say falling forward onto your face is something enjoyable. Well, then why is it the other day that I heard a guy say right out loud he thinks he's falling in love, but he didn't say it like this, crap, I think I'm falling, crap, I think I'm falling in love. That's not how he said it. He said it like he was excited. Why do we call it falling in love? Why don't we call it rising in love, not falling in love? I mean, really? Because most of the time when you fall, it's going to hurt when you hit the ground. This play will play that game, see, of the way we need to analyze our language and the complicated way that sometimes things that should be good are not so good. Let's point that out. This is a play of paradoxes. Do we know what that is? Let's put that in our notes. What is a paradox? A paradox. Do we know that? A hyperbole, a paradox, an oxymoron. These all mean the same thing. Sometimes you've heard that word pronounced oxymoron. What does all of that mean? These two things which fit together or do not fit together. Do not fit together, right? Do not fit together, right? Things that don't quite fit together, like, for example... Jumbo shrimp. Yeah, right? Jumbo shrimp comes to mind as an example, doesn't it? Or how about this? Shakespeare says, falling in love. Now, there's an oxymoron that really is a nasty one. That is to say, you jump up and down so excited for love and then... Well, now, wait a minute. If you just walked into this play and you hadn't had any background, the very first time you see Romeo, when we're told... That he's walking around, oh, my life seems, oh, I'm so sad. Why sad? Because the girl won't return his text. 
The assumption would be, if you don't know this play, that the girl he's talking about is Juliet. You would think. That's no. the name of the play. Rosalind. Right? That's the name of the play is Romeo and Juliet. Right? When we meet Romeo for the first time, he's ready. Are you ready for this? He is ready to off himself because the girl won't return his text. <laughs> She's got no interest in him. And the girl ain't Juliet. Dude, Romeo doesn't know Juliet even exists. The girl he's into is a girl named Rosalind, who he says, this is the most beautiful girl in the world and I'm totally in love and I'll never love another girl. His pal says, why don't you just go to the party, see other girls, and you'll totally forget about Rosaline. Romeo's response is, that'll never happen. I'm so in love with Rosaline, I will never, ever fail to be in love with Rosaline. No girl could change me from this. He is totally convinced of that. And then he goes to the party. <laughs> right. Winder goes, poof, just like that. Like, everything he said about Rosaline, completely gone. And now he sees Juliet, and he's totally in love with Juliet. Now, Shakespeare is going to ask a very disturbing question. Does Romeo go to the party so that he can meet another girl? No, he does not. Does Romeo go to the party so that he can fall in love with Juliet? No, he does not. Romeo is totally in love with Rosaline. So it begs a disturbing question to both female and male viewers of this play. To female viewers, obviously the question is, dude, are guys really like this? That they can be totally into one girl. And they really are totally into one girl. And then they completely can forget about her and be totally into the next girl. I mean, are guys really like that? Of course, guy viewers of this play will ask, is that really how guys are? In other words, as we'll hear it said in the play, guys don't fall in love with their hearts. They fall in love with their eyes. In other words, they like what they see until they like something else better that they see. Which begs a really intriguing question then. How will a girl ever trust a guy when the guy says to the girl, no, 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 you're the, you're the one. Well, the girl might say, yeah, I'm the one until I'm not the one. No, 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 you don't understand. You're totally the one for all time. But yeah, that's what Romeo said about Rosaline until he saw Juliet. Oh, wait a minute. Then that's what he said about Juliet, which begs obviously the question, was he for real? But at the end of the play, we already, know what, we already know what happens. At the end of the play, he really was for real. Well, what's the difference? And why is it that he goes for Juliet and he, doesn't go, and he, and, and, and he kind of breaks it up with, with Rosaline? And the simple answer is Juliet gives him the time of day. Are guys really that shallow? That it really is just a matter of they fall in love with whatever it is they're looking at. And if the girl looks back, then they're in love. And if the girl doesn't look back, i.e. Rosaline, then they're not in love. But let's not just pick on guys. Clearly this play asks us to think about girls as well. I mean, seriously? Juliet is on stage with Romeo for all of 37 seconds of FaceTime. And she's already ready to marry him. And she will say, if I can't marry him, I will die. That's what she says. But it would seem childish and silly, except for the way the play ends, which is... Right. So all of a sudden we begin to ask Shakespeare again, making us think, his thinking audience, making us ask this question, is this a play about love or is it a play about young love? See, because think about this. The first time that we will meet Juliet, her mother will be talking to her about a marriage. Now, again, if you didn't know this play, you might guess it would be between her and Romeo. No, no, no. This is about a marriage between a much older man. She's not the same age as Paris. Paris is much older. It tells us, it gives us an insight into what happens in Shakespeare's day. What happens in Shakespeare's day? Yeah, guys and girls don't go to the party, meet, and fall in love. That's big time against the rules, which is why they can't tell their parents. Got me? Well, then how do guys and girls get married in this time? That's the whole point of the scene between Lord Capulet and Paris. Paris shows up to ask Juliet's dad, can I marry her? How old is Juliet? 14. 
14. She is barely, barely 14. She's probably closer to 13, right? And Romeo and Juliet's dad says what? What does Juliet's dad say? Well, yeah, two things. One, dude, can we like hold off on the marriage talk for just a year or two at least? Let her get a little older. But more interestingly, number two, he says, why don't you get to know her first? Paris has never met Juliet. We will find out in the next scene. When Juliet's mom says, do you think you could hang with Paris and marry him? Why is she interested? This ain't got nothing to do with sex. This has got to do with marrying families because you're trying to have money. Paris comes from wealth. His daddy has his own parking spot at the country club, just like Juliet's daddy does. In other words, this is about bringing together families of wealth, of money. It ain't got nothing to do with love. It ain't got nothing to do with sex. It's got to do with money, bringing families together. Interestingly, though, Juliet's mama says, do you think you could maybe? And she goes, I look to like if looking like you move, Juliet's never seen Paris. She doesn't even know what he looks like. She says, well, first let me like see, can I at least see what he looks like? This is what we call, for your notes, arranged marriages. Well, this play seems to suggest that when you let kids go to parties and pick their own guy or girl, what happens at the end? See, we're going to talk at the end of this play about the conservative nature of this play. Shakespeare maybe has an agenda here where he's going to point out arranged marriages make sense. Allowing kids to pick their own guy or their own girl. Well, how does this play end? And to that decree, let's just say it out loud before we even begin the play. Really, this isn't a play about love. It's a play about politics. The relationship between peoples. Namely, peoples who have wealth and those wealthy people who don't like each other. Got me? The play actually will begin right away with an observation or two in the prologue. Take a look at it. This is a sonnet. Shakespeare is brilliant at his sonnet writing. We'll look more at his sonnets as we become seniors. But let's look at just one of his offerings. Notice what constitutes a sonnet. You've got 14 lines. You've got a rhyme scheme where, did you see this? The last word of the first line rhymes with the last word of the, look at it real quickly. The last word of the, of the first line rhymes with the last word of the second of the third line. See how that works, right? Take a look at it. Dignity line, rhymes with mutiny. Scene rhymes with unclean. We will call this a sonnet of Shakespearean Elizabethan sonnet where the rhyme scheme is. Can you figure out what the what I'm saying? A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. Notice the last two lines we call the rhyming couplet. They rhyme together. Finally. To make this a full sonnet, we will have the use of what we call iambic pentameter. Iambic, for your notes, pentameter. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's read the lines and we'll maybe try and figure out. I'll give you a hint. For you music people, you're going to love this. It has to do with rhythm. It has to do with rhythm, okay? The beat of the line. Take a look at it real quickly. Two households, both alike in dignity... In fair Verona, where we lay our scene from ancient grudge, break to new mutiny. Where civil blood leaves make civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their bare death bury their parents' strife. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. First off, let's just ask a question in a 2B. If it's a sonnet, it's got to have 14 lines. Check. If it's a sonnet, it's got to have a rhyme scheme. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Check. What's this thing about iambic pentameter? It has to do with rhythm. Watch how there's two ways to read the opening lines of this play. I'll read it the first way, and then I'll read it a different way the second time. Follow with me. You should be looking at the book as you go. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. Now that's one way to read it. But there's a second way to read it that begins to emphasize the rhythm of the lines. You watch... I read, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Do you see the line? From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. 
See the line? A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Do you see it? Watch my hand. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Do you see it? Now, if we wanted to scan this on a board, we do it like this. Watch this. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. You see it? This ba-bum is what we call an iambic foot. Ba-bum. That's the way, by the way, that's the way we speak in the English language. We use this ba-bum a lot, right? If I've got five of those, one, two, three, four, five, I call that pentameter. Pen means five, right? Pentameter. So I'm talking about iambic pentameter. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. By the way, just to show you how easy it is to do this, try and write down right now a line of iambic pentameter of anything. I wish that I was someplace else right now. See how I did that? Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. I just made that up. Go, see if you can do it real quickly. Try and jot down in your notes one line of potentially iambic pentameter. Go ahead, give it a try. It's not as difficult as it sounds, right? I wish that I was someplace else right now. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, right? Go ahead, give it a try. And it's okay if you look like some bag person and uh, street person in Denver moving your mouth while you do this. It's a little bit easier to try and hear it that way. And then try and write the actual words down, okay? See how it works for you, okay? Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Okay? That's what we call iambic pentameter, right? A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. See, some of you guys are doing it. Writing it down makes it even easier to see it, right? Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Okay? Yeah. Now, are you ready for this? Put it in your notes. Let's just say it out loud. This is the genius of the cat we're looking at. Shakespeare writes the entire play of Romeo and Juliet in iambic pentameter. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. But let's point out something even cooler. The only time that he breaks the iambic pentameter is when there's friction in the play, there's about to be a fight. Now, why would he do that? Because when there's a fight, there isn't harmony. When there's no harmony, there's no rhythm. And therefore, no iambic. So right from the very beginning, we're going to point out Shakespeare's genius right away. But wait a minute. Help me to understand the opening lines of the play, right? So we've got a prologue where we're told where we are. We are in Italy and Verona, right? Notice the opening lines. This is going to be a play not about two lovers, but about two households. Notice both alike in dignity means what? They go to the same country club, right? They, they, both, they all have their own parking spot at the same country club, right? In fair Verona where we lay our scene, uh-oh, what's the third line mean? From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny means what about these two households? They, they hate each other's own. guts. Yeah, they hate each other's guts. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Let's point out something sophisticated about this play. In the fifth, sixth line of this play, you are already told what's going to happen to Romeo and Juliet. Think about that. You do not have to read some plot summary. You do not have to watch the play and get to the end to know. R and J are going to get jacked. You are told this from the opening lines of the play. How are they going to die? What's it say? A pair of Starcars lovers do what? They, they take their lives. They commit, they commit suicide. This is going to be a play about suicide. Right? So right from the very beginning, we're going to ask... Is this a play about love? Or is this a play about, well, sad Jack love? <laughs> or let's call it what he calls it. A pair of what lovers? Star-crossed. Dude, what does that mean? Star-crossed. I need some help understanding what that means. It's way more sophisticated than simply they, they fall in love at nighttime when the stars are out. What does star-crossed literally mean? And then we'll get to its implied meanings with McKendry, unavoidable love. What does it mean, star-crossed? I'm, 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 I'm asking you to be somewhat literal here in your notes. What does that mean? Do you know anything about horoscopes? And do you know anything about the assumption that the stars have anything to do, and the movement of the planets have anything to do with what happens? We have a word. It starts with F or sometimes D. What's this? 
fate or what? What's the D word? Destiny. Destiny. Good. Write it down. What do we mean when we talk about a pair of star-crossed lovers? What does that even mean? It's destined to be. No, no, no. I'm not asking the implied meaning. I'm asking the literal meaning. When are you were going to help us out? What does this mean? Star-crossed. Uh, doesn't it mean like... What do the Elizabethans believe about the stars and the movement of the planets in regards to the horoscope? Do you ever see this in the paper? What is your horoscope? Read your horoscope. What does that mean? Tell your future. Meaning what, though? Future contingent on what? Stops. You got it. The movement of the planets. There was an assumption that if you wanted, no kidding, doctors in 1600, when they went to, you didn't go to see them, they came to see you. There were no hospitals. You went to see them. And when the doctor came in and he looked at you, he said, I got to make a decision about what's wrong with you, but hang on a second. And he would go outside. They came at night. He would go outside, look up at the stars. No kidding. I'm not making this up. You looked at the stars to figure out what was wrong with you. Why? Because there was this assumption that everything was kind of like control, destiny, by virtue of the stars. Well, now, if that's the case, star-crossed lovers, as McHenry says, means it's inevitable. In other words, it has to happen. In other words, the kids didn't have a choice. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're already to the sixth line. And notice we're asking a really disturbing question. Do you have a choice in your life to do what you do? Are you actually free? Are Romeo and Juliet free to fall in love? If this is destiny, and we're told in the same line, they kill themselves, then who's to blame for this? Stars. Notice three lines earlier, though, Butterfield, we are told who's to blame. Two households who don't get along so well. Who's to blame in all this? See, it's going to be one of the penultimate questions of this play. Do you blame the kids? Do you blame the parents? Do you blame, uh-oh, Friar Lawrence? He's the guy who actually marries them. Do you blame the nurse who knew all along this was happening and she let it happen? Who was the messenger? Right, you could blame the messenger who screws it up, gets jacked in quarantine, and doesn't make it. Right? We got any number of potential blames, and we're only six lines into the play. See how this works? Shakespeare then for us is going to give us all kinds of things to think about, about love and about politics. Now, how are we going to study this play? Good question. I'm glad you asked it. Write down a few final notes, and then I'll, we'll end our lecture together. There are different ways to, watch, to, to study this play. One way to do it is to watch the play. That's how Shakespeare would want us to do it. Remember, in his own lifetime, he didn't publish his works. In other words, for all of you that say, now I've not read the book, but I've seen the movie, Shakespeare would go right on. That's exactly right. In other words, you want to watch the performance. But here's the problem. He wrote the play for people living in 1600, not for you. So there's going to be all kinds of information you, you won't naturally get, like biting your thumb, unless you've got some capacity to actually read the play. Got me? So we take multiple options to the study of this play in the following order. One. We will actually read the play by doing an annotative reading. By that I mean, we will have professional actors who are on tape and will listen to them working with the lines. While they talk, we read. Got me? Now, you will have already done your own reading after a plot summary study and then your actual reading annotations. So for you, this won't be the first time that you've heard the lines. Got me? We'll then do what we call an annotative reading of the play. In other words, we'll read a few lines together, then we'll talk about it. We'll read a few more lines together, then we'll talk about it. Does that make sense? So that we work through the play line by line. Got me? So we're working on multiple levels, that is to say three levels of reading. What does the text say? What does it mean? And how do we relate to it in some way? Notice we've covered a lot of ground just in the first six lines. You got me? Okay. Finally, at moments in the play of our study, we will then watch versions of the play. Now there's two that we'll be looking at. And this is a fascinating time to be lecturing this play to you because there is a new version of Romeo and Juliet that's a film version that's about to be released, okay? Uh, and so, and they're coming out all the time. I mean, you know, there, there are performances of Romeo and Juliet all the time on the stage itself. We'll watch two. One by a famous Italian filmmaker named Zeffirelli. Okay, that's one. The second will be a pretty, pretty remarkable performance uh, uh, by Leonardo DiCaprio, who a number of years ago made a film version of Romeo and Juliet, 
But it really shocked a lot of people because he didn't, and the, and the group did not dress up in Elizabethan Renaissance clothes. They adapted the plague to make it appear like gang violence plague, where two gangs are fighting. And you'll get to see that. So, for example, instead of fighting with swords, they fight with guns, for example. Now, a number of the photographs that you will see in your book are referenced to this performance, okay? Uh, who, they were surprised that it was so popular when they released it in the theater, that it did so well. All right, so that's how we will begin our study of Romeo and Juliet.